All right, welcome back to Off the Bench, presented by United Dairy Farmers, and here he is. I mean, he's got the purple TCU I wear on. This today. I mean, looking good. Thank you. I understand that uh, you had a sweatshirt that you brought in today. Yep. And uh, Paul, did you have a, a TCU thing on yesterday? I did. I had a TCU hoodie on yesterday, See, Marty. That, that, I mean, as I told the boys outside, um, if they were one in six right now. <laughs> This would not be <laughs> well, no doubt. because at the end of the day, admit it or not, you're all front runners. Well, I'm not, but, but well, you I have know a vested that interest. You are. I definitely know that. Well, I, I can't say Paul is because Xavier basketball, they've stunk the last couple of years. And he and hung with them. He hung with them. God him. bless you for that. <laughs> and, um, and, and so, you know, that is what it is. Yeah. Um, your grandson, without a doubt, one of the all time great front runners. It, maybe he would be the poster boy if you looked in the dictionary for the definition. A front runner. Yeah, and then there's Casey, who, Dad, I, I, I don't know. I know you watch the show. You're on the I show do. every single week. Is it, Casey, uh, are you are you a, a subtle, below the line front runner? No. What Casey oh, is is the complete opposite of that. Oh, there is. was that line in the movie Apocalypse Now, yes, where the Marlon Brando character talked about the smell of war and the smell of napalm. Correct. <laughs> the smell for Casey's house is that no matter who the Bengals play. They could be playing the 72 Miami Dolphins who never lost a game. And Casey would feel real good about the Bengals beating them. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, the ultimate front runner. Yeah. There's no question about that. Well, I mean, he's a hardcore fan. All right, well, thanks for coming in today. No problem. I it know you're out. still doing a lot of work with the Reds Community Fund. I mean, you, you've, you've raised. Well, this is for the Hall of Fame. Oh, the Hall of Fame. Okay, yeah, but, yeah. But, but you have raised literally millions of dollars through the years. And all the incredible work that Charlie Frank does up there running the Reds community. He's the best. Fund. I mean, it's 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 been amazing. So the hall the, the the hall of fame. You're going and speaking at a senior living home, right? I am. That's only uh, seven minutes from here. It worked out perfectly. I got to be there at one o'clock. So I mean, it it uh, couldn't have been better. And it's better for me to be here than sitting at home doing this. Well, especially with that tired. Uh, Tired what? Weighted, whatever that is. What? Uh, what are you talking about? you have set up where when, when we, you, you join us from your home. You know, <laughs> you, your home in, in North Carolina it looks great. But uh, I don't know my, what's my going place on in, in North, Cincinnati. My place in North Carolina is nothing but a, a, a damn wall behind me. There's, there's no creativity at all. No, but whatever in that is location. inside the wall is what's working. Because it's that internet and it looks great in the in the background. You've got the window behind you, okay, and, and it's clear and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I understand. Maybe we can help you a little bit here. Yeah, well, maybe you can. You know, I had a guy came up to me the other day, and I think I was I might have been in UDF. I don't say it because they're our sponsor. Um, and and we got to talking for a minute. He recognized me, and and he assumed for a second. Yes. And I'm curious if this happens to you a lot. He assumed that our family, the Brenneman family, yeah. that we have always been Ohioans. Do you get that a lot? Uh, as a matter of fact, I don't. Okay. No, people, okay. Uh, no, I do not get that, no. But you are a native Virginian. I am a native Virginian, and uh, yes. I was born in Portsmouth, Virginia in 1942. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which makes there. you 80 years young. It's... It, well, it, sometimes it is young, sometimes it ain't. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and I was, and I stayed there and went to, you know, went to grade school, went to high school, and then left home when I was 18 to go to college at a small school in Virginia, Randolph Macon College, which is north of Richmond on the way to Washington, D.C. on Route 1. And uh, when I left home, I effectively left home. I mean, I, I came home in the summertime and worked uh, every summer and came home at Christmas and worked over Christmas holiday. But uh, for all intents and purposes, not unlike a lot of kids, when you leave home and go to college, you're pretty much done. You're pretty much done unless something uh, untoward occurs and you're forced to be back home for long lengths of time. But, um, you know, stayed at Randolph-Macon for two and a half years and then transferred to Carolina because I could not get in. When I uh, got out of high school, my grades were not good enough. It was equally as tough then to get in as an out-of-state student as it is now. Mm -hmm. And I uh, transferred, because transferring, amazingly, and I don't know if it's true of other schools, but you can transfer to Carolina if you've got a, yeah. you've got a C average in yep. college yep. and you want to transfer, it's easy to transfer. And I did transfer. A lot of people don't, and I understand that. 
but I did, and, and that's I went there because I wanted to get a degree in communications, and I did that. Yeah. You know, the, the one of the real knocks I've always had on um, broadcasting schools inside of major universities is not giving kids who come there wanting to be a play-by-play guy. Correct. Um, the opportunity early on to do that, to find out, A, if they like it, B, are they any good at it, and before you know it, you've wasted a year or two, and you find out it's either one or the other, and now you've blown, Lord knows, in this day Correct. And age, how much money. That's right. Did Carolina give you a chance early on? They did not. They not not. But I did get some. I I worked at the campus radio station, uh, at which WUNC, which is one of the more respected yep. uh, college radio stations in in the universe. Uh, but in terms of a getting a chance to ply my trade and and i knew i wanted to be a play-by-play guy i knew when i went to chapel hill that i did not want to be a guy that sat in front of a tv camera and got three minutes to do sports at six and eleven o'clock at night i did not want to do that i wanted to be a play-by-play guy i got a chance to work albeit no play-by-play but the guy who was the voice of the Tar Heels back then, a fellow by the name of Bill Curry, who was an incredible character. I mean, he was just, uh, he was legendary. He worked as a sports director at WSOC-TV in Charlotte, did all the Carolina football and basketball games. And he gave me an opportunity in, in basketball to sit and do halftime stats on the Carolina network and, and comment every now and then uh, on the game. And I knew that this is what I was going to do um, and and was forever grateful to Bill, who later left Charlotte and left Carolina and went to Pittsburgh. And I used to see him all the time when we'd go in to play the Pirates. He worked at KDKA. Um, but I didn't get any, uh, any uh, you know, play-by-play experience until I got out of school and got a job at a radio station in Salisbury, North Carolina. Which is why I try to tell young people, and, and, and you've talked to, to tens of thousands of these young men and women through the years about, you know, how'd you get started? What would you recommend? You know, all those kinds of things. Um, that's why it's amazing some of the stuff that these kids, the opportunities they're being given even in high school. Incredible now. now. Yeah, it's unbelievable. It really is. So, you know, I don't know at the end of the day, and I don't know if there's anybody on the planet that can answer this question. I don't know if that means that you have a better chance of doing it later in life. But the point is, guys like you and others from your generation, even my generation for sure, and maybe the next generation uh, behind me, yeah. uh, were a lot of guys that weren't, weren't getting a lot of opportunities even into their early 20s. And, I, and as I look back on it, um, I wonder, you don't, you don't know. Uh, you, so it's easy to say, I want to be a play-by-play guy. And that's a general type of statement, because if someone had said to me back then, OK, fine, we've established what you want to do with your life as far as a vocation is concerned. Is there a sport that you want to concentrate on? And I would have I would not have come up with an answer for that question. And, and because I truly did not know. All I knew is I wanted to do play by play. My main interests were, were football and baseball and basketball. Now, maybe baseball was last, mm-hmm. to be honest with you. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm off and running. And, and, and thank God I had some ability early and, and learned my craft as I went. Um, there's no way I could have gone to a good-sized station that expected a certain level of talent and, and made it. But when you go to a small 1,000-watt radio station um, in the middle of the state of North Carolina and they give you every conceivable opportunity to do everything you can physically do because I did high school football and basketball. I did small college, Catawba College, football and basketball. I did American Legion baseball. I did football for the black college there, Livingstone. I did everything. And, and if you have any ability, uh, doing that much work is going to come out. And, and so they couldn't pay me enough to be good right out of the chute. Thank God for that, because I wasn't. Um, but in five years, I got more experience. And when the time came that a job appealed to me and I could leave Salisbury and go to a bigger market, I was ready to do that. We were talking before you got here, and, and Paul had brought up about you know uh, your work in basketball, and, and I started to touch a little bit upon the ABA and yeah. what that was like. Now, I think you have to be somebody even older than me 
to truly appreciate what the ABA was. But the bottom line is, when you were there, you saw two or three of the greatest players of all time on your, the team you were broadcasting for every single night. Well, that's why I, that's, uh, to tell people, I was blessed to travel the road I travel because I was thrown together with some uh, great teams or and or great players. And when I went to, uh, to Virginia, when that franchise moved out of Washington, D.C., and moved into Virginia to become a regional franchise. They played in Norfolk, and they played in Hampton. They played in Roanoke, and they played in Richmond. Uh, most of the games were played at a great facility back then called the Scope in downtown Norfolk. Um, the first player whose greatness I came across, across paths was with Charlie Scott, um, the first black player ever to play at Carolina. Uh, the story is well known. Dean Smith recruited him right from under Lefty Drizel at Davidson. And Charlie came to Carolina and was just a sensational basketball player and carried that later on into the pros. Well, he was he was uh, the big gun when I came to Virginia to do the Squire games in 71. And then a year later, um, a guy by the name of Julius Irving left the University of Massachusetts and, and came to Virginia. And I think, you know, it, Willie Sojourner was a teammate of his at the University of Utah, and he dubbed him the doctor, uh, shortened to doc. And uh, then a guy by the name of George Gervin mm -hmm. out of Eastern Michigan came. So you're talking three players uh, that are going to rank in anybody's top 100. In, in Julius's case and in Gervin's case, the top 50. Charlie would not be too far away from that if, if in fact, he is. So I was very, very, very fortunate to watch these guys in the infancy of their NBA or ABA and later all three NBA careers. Um, and and it, it was just in, incredible to watch, especially watching uh, uh, Julius Irving play early. You know, I want to stay on the basketball theme for a second because when, when you were at North Carolina uh, or shortly before or shortly thereafter, uh, and then as you moved along in your career, you got to, to be around guys who are, are some of the biggest names that maybe in, in the generation today they don't talk about them, and it's sad that they don't. Right. Uh, in Dean Smith. Correct. And uh, Larry Brown. Yeah. Uh, Larry Brown was a player at North Carolina for Dean Smith. If I'm not mistaken, he was the first Olympian from North Carolina. Yes. I, I could be wrong on that. No, I think you're right. Uh, but he, he – I, I remember Mike Jeminski, uh, the former great player at Duke, one of the top five players in the history of the Atlantic Coast Conference. Uh, he, he, at one point, he was number one in scoring and one, number one or two in rebounding. He said, without a doubt, greatest coach he ever had was Larry Brown. Um, these two guys were, were very interesting guys. In Dean's case, you, you really got to know him quite well. What an amazing human being, not just a coach. He was a, he he was an amazing, well, incredible human being. There, people don't realize um, what a great person he was. Uh, he was never a guy to beat his own uh, drum and pat himself on the back. Uh, the innovations that he brought to the game of college basketball uh, were incredible, and they are timeless. They are still being done by teams today. Um, and and I did. I uh, in fact, when when we came to Virginia, and I tell this story all the time, um, uh, Doug Moe and Larry Brown were both members of the Virginia Squires. Both were players. Uh, Doug, of course, turned out to be a great NBA coach for thousands of years, it seemed like, with the Denver club and also the San Antonio team. And um, we went down to Chapel Hill. I mean, I, I, you know, I made the comment to them one day that, you know, my son would like to go to Coach Smith's basketball mm -hmm. camp. And and so I, and they said, we'll take care of that. And so they came back later and said, he, Tom's all set to go. And I, and I said, I, I, I called Coach Smith and thanked him and, and said, is, here's my address in Virginia Beach, send me. He said, there is no charge. And I said, Coach, I, I can't do that. I said, the fact that he can go is, is enough. He said, well, you got two choices. You can let him come and it's on us, or you cannot let him come because you want to pay and he ain't coming. <laughs> and I said, well, okay. And I think he went two years. Yeah. And, and then, uh, so he, but he was an enigma. Um, if I can tell a story about how he could be, if you were a Carolina guy and you wanted to work, uh, you were being considered to work for uh, Jefferson Pilot, who had the rights at that time. 
to the conference. At the conference, and you wanted, to, and they seriously were considering you. If you were a Carolina guy, he'd go to the mat for you. If you were a Duke guy, or you were a Wake Forest guy, or you were anybody else's guy besides Carolina, you had to prove to him that you were worthy of that job. Um, and so the fact that I worked in the conference for three years later on uh, was a slam dunk because Coach Smith endorsed me to the high heavens. However, there were times in which he and I crossed swords. Uh, I'll never forget, I did a game in 1986, I guess, um, in, in Chapel Hill. Uh, it, it was a top game of the year because it was Carolina was number one, Clemson was number two. Uh, Cliff Ellis coached at Clemson. He had Horace Grant and all that. They had a great team. The weekend before, on a Sunday, I did, Billy Packer and I did a game at the University of Maryland. Uh, this is late in the season now. But Dean had a deal where if, if you were an out-of-state kid and he wanted you to come to Carolina, he would promise you that at one point during your stay in Chapel Hill, he would schedule a game with a university reasonably close to where your family lived so they could come see you play. Carolina had a big man named Joe Wolf. And so- From um, Wisconsin. Yes. So we, uh, uh, we went to, um, we went to, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Billy and I did a game at Maryland. And so it was on a Saturday night late in the year and we were we had to go to chapel hill on sunday afternoon the next day for a game against marquette that was a connection with joe wolf because he was from wisconsin so we hooked a ride on the carolina charter out of um out of uh maryland into raleigh durham got in there late the game was like three o'clock in the afternoon um and at the uh, smith center and Carolina was sluggish. They were overwhelming favorites, and they finally turned it on the last five minutes and blew Marquette away. Well, with a half a minute to go in the game, uh, the director came into my ear. They had a big deal called the Holly Farms Player of the Game. And so he said, who do you want as Holly Farms? I said, I, I, don't, I don't care. I, I don't, I, you know, we, we got stuff going on. I said, get back to me before you need. Well, I never heard back from him. And so the Holly Farms player of the game was J.R. Reed. <clears throat> you know, he did this, he did that. The next day, next weekend, I'm in Chapel Hill on Saturday to, to do the Clemson Carolina game. And Friday, I go watch him practice, watch Clemson practice, and then watch Carolina practice. At the end of the Carolina practice, this young lady, a student manager, one of the student managers came up to me and said, Mr. Brenneman, Coach Smith would like to see you. So I said, well, this is like the audience with a pope sure. you know so i go downstairs and uh shake hands and and uh he says to me right out of the i mean cold turkey he says now i've known him for a long time he said marty he said sometimes i give you people more credit for knowing something about this game than you do i'm taken aback i said what, the, what are you talking about coach he said last week you people gave jr reed the holly farms player of the game he said he had four rebounds in 36 minutes. He said, Joe Wolf did this. Kenny Smith did this. How in the world? Now, and I'm a little bit hot now. I said, Coach, with all due respect, let me explain something to you. I got more to worry about than the Holly Farms player of the game. <laughs> and he said, you don't realize what a big thing it is for my kids and for all the kids that play in the ACC to be singled out like that on an ACC telecast. I said, well, God bless him for it. But I said, I'm running around like a chicken with my head cut off trying to wrap this telecast. He said, very abruptly. Okay, he said, I've got to talk to you, Billy Packer. I'll talk to him about this later on in the week. I said, you do that. <laughs> That's the way he was. he was. He was an enigma. He was an enigma in every aspect of, of his life. Now, a, a guy you got to know later, we'll get to some baseball stuff here in a minute, but I, I think a lot of you are, are, are not familiar with, with the, this side of your career, and Paul even brought it up before you got here. The other guy you got to know, I don't and, know where you're going with this. there's nothing that's an enigma about this guy. Look at the boy, the power's behind the well, throne over I here. I mean, this was a guy that, you know, I love Dean Smith. I mean, but now you're setting me up. For now. me, no, 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 no. But for me, I mean, this guy was my kind of guy. Okay. And you got to know this guy right. who couldn't be a more polar opposite to Dean Smith, and that is the general, Bobby oh. Knight. Oh, man. 
He was something. He was unbelievable. He was unbelievable. You went to his camp. Yeah. When I came here, he was a Reds fan. Hey, you talk about a front runner now. No, there's no doubt. Because later on, he got that <laughs> like that with Tony La Russa when Cardinals were winning world championships every year, it seemed like. Yeah, I he that, you know, thank God he was a Reds fan when I came to Cincinnati in 74. And, and he became a big fan of mine, and I became a big fan of his. And he um, – he wanted me to do back then, and I'm sure there are some older people that will remember this. But uh, back then, when ESPN had not become a major presence as far as televising uh, college athletics, each each of the better programs um, had the, their own statewide network, right. and all the games that weren't televised. Uh, this it happened at Kentucky because I did Kentucky games for two years with the same type of package. Indiana uh, had the same deal, and uh, these were mostly non-conference games. But there were 10 or 12 games, and it was a nice package. And he wanted me to do those games. So I met with some people. I'll never forget. The, the, it used to be the Holiday Inn on 8th and Lynn Street. And I met with them over lunch one day, and, and, and they laid it all out for me, and they said, yeah, Coach Knight really wants you to do this package. And as the conversation wore on, um, I realized that, that, that uh, Bobby wanted me to come up there two or three times a week to watch practice in advance of a game. As you well know, there ain't no easy way to get to Bloomington, no. Indiana. No. And I said, yeah, I can't do that. Uh, I'm not going to do that. I said, I can do that program justice if I come up there the, like the day before they play, watch them play, spend the night, do the game, and bang back to Cincinnati. Well, that wasn't good enough for him. And he was hotter than a match because I could not do – I would not do the games. And I said besides that, um, maybe even a bigger thing because I also had to do the Sunday coaches show. Back then they were big deals. You don't see them much anymore. And, and it would go all over the state. He had already walked off the set once. Uh, uh, I think the guy's name was uh, Chuck Marlowe. I think that was his name. It, it did the show, and Bob, he got mad one day. Bobby did a question that he asked him, and he walked off the set in the middle of the program. And I told these guys, I said, Coach uh, Knight would do that one time with me, and that'd be it. We'd be done forever. So it didn't work out. Then came the Olympic team that he coached in 1984, I think it was. It played in Los Dream Angeles. Team. Yes. It was, uh, well, it was a college team. It was not a pro team. Well, that's right. That's right. That's yeah. right. It was, a, but he had, but he had, here's, he had Charlie Scott. He had Patrick Ewing. He had um, uh, the big kid. Wayman from, Tisdale. Wayman Tisdale. From Oklahoma. Preacher's son. Yep. Uh, John Konkak from uh, SMU. They, these guys could play. So they were. we were staying in San Diego playing the Padres, and they were training there. And um, they were a week before the Olympic Games, they were going to stay there for another four or five days in San Diego and then go up to L.A. and then play. And so we, uh, Jim Ferguson was the Reds' media relations director, and he was really tight with Bob. Big guy you got. Knew him way back when yeah. Bob was at Ohio State. So he, uh, Jim calls me and he finally said, uh, uh, Bob wants us to come watch them practice. Uh, they're scrimmaging the Portland uh, Trailblazer rookies. Jack Ramsey was coaching them tomorrow, after, tomorrow morning. And he, want, he, he said, no media, nobody there but NBA scouts and the Olympic officials and the teams. Would you like to go? I said, would I? He said, Co Bob will meet us at a side entrance. It was San Diego Sports Arena. We go down there, and the whole way in, walking from there to the basketball court, I had to be lambasted by him about, now you're going to see what basketball is all about. That blah, 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 ACC crap that you did for three years. He said, well, pale by comparison to what you He was a little bit flowery. We go in there and sit down, and they start scrimmaging, and there are NBA scouts from every team. And we are the only non-basketball people in that building. That's how tight a ship he ran. And it was the kind of thing that both he and Ramsey could stop play and instruct a kid about. Twice, Wayman Tisdale got beat on a pick and roll from the top of the circle. Two times down the floor. Bob called timeout. He went out there. He said, no, son. I mean, I almost had to walk out of there. I was laughing so hard. He said, now, 
you played for a coach in Billy Tubbs that did not know how to spell the word defense. He said, if I see that one time, once the Olympic Games, you're going to be over there sitting by me. Now, do you understand? I said, he said, yes, sir. John Konkak did something. John Konkak was a great player. Bobby kicked the ball into the second deck of the sports arena and ran him off the floor. He said, go into the dressing room. He said, you're done here today. I'm not going to look at this anymore. That night we had him on the radio, and he said Michael Jordan was the greatest athlete he'd ever coached. He said Wayman Tisdale was the greatest kid that he'd ever been associated with. Tisdale's dad was a Baptist minister, and he was, he was eloquent in talking about his team. And, of course, they, you know, they go up there and, and they win the national championship. But he, he was – Gold medal. I mean, the gold yeah. medal. I'm sorry, the gold medal. He was, he was really uh, incredible to, to be around and to talk basketball with. Um, and I, I cherish the times that I spent with him because you're talking about two of the greatest of all time yeah. in, in Dean Smith and, and, and Bob Knight. I think it's a shame, and, and we'll save this for another day. I, I just think it's such a shame in, in this day and age. You can't coach like that anymore. And, no, and, you can't. And, and it's, it, 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 you're not doing the kids of today – Although mom and dad feel like little Johnny, you know, is you can't handle that kind of thing, or little Susie, um, I totally disagree. I think you talk to professional athletes, especially in football and basketball, they want structure. Right. They want to know exactly where you stand. And if you get your ass jumped every now and again, or more than every now and again, it's okay. And, and the other thing is, Tom, he graduated his kids. No doubt. When, so did Dean. When, yeah. When, you're, when your parents... Uh, allow you to commit to a certain institution. And I don't know whether that, that plays as strongly today as it did back then, but uh, you're going to get a college degree. And when, when Bob Knight or Dean Smith said that to a parent in their home and recruiting the kid, they could count on the fact that unless something occurred, you know, uh, and, and everything went according to Hoyle, this kid was going to graduate with a degree. And they were two of the best at that. All right, I want to get to some of the uh, questions that we got from people online. Um, and, and I'm going to start with this one since we're talking a little bit about basketball. Tim wants to know, Marty once told me, apparently you've met Tim. We'll he see. He said, you once told me that basketball was easier to call than baseball. Why? I never said that. You never said that? I mean, I been, might have been drunk if I said it, but I, I don't believe it. I'd have had to have been drunk if I said that. And I didn't do that very often. There's no way. I've often said publicly that the toughest sport of all to do is baseball. Well, that's what he's saying. Oh, he said, he oh, said, yeah. He said basketball, oh, baseball is easier than baseball. Oh, absolutely. So you weren't drunk and he wasn't no, drunk. No, no, he's, he was, he's dead right. Okay. 100%. I You're did right, say that Tim. and I've said that often. I think <laughs> You've been out of rehab a few years, but it's okay. If there's a pure art form in play-by-play -play sports, <laughs> that's not true, by the way. I know that. I know that. <laughs> Uh, if there's a play, if there's a true art form in play-by-play -play sports, it would be baseball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let's see. Josh wants to know. Josh, um, who do you consider to be the best all time at calling games in any sport? Well, let me say this: I think the best play-by-play -play announcer of every sport he did. Um, and he did, he did Oakland Raiders football, he did Golden State basketball, and he did Oakland Athletic Baseball. All three were Bill King, mm -hmm. the best. I'm not, and if people don't believe me, go on YouTube or wherever you need to go to find examples of his play-by-play -play work. Bill's been dead now for a number of years. The best announcer at a given sport is uh, Vin Scully mm -hmm. in baseball. But Ben was also great in golf and, and whatever else he did. But uh, as far as all-around ability uh, and, and, and doing it at three major league sports, and Bill King was really something. He really was. I, I, I would throw the name Dick Enberg at you on that. Enberg, uh, would, well, yeah. Although he did not, yeah, but I'm, I'm, he, he did network stuff. He did uh, Angels baseball. And in his latter years, he did San Diego yep. Padres baseball. Uh, and he was doing the he was doing the ACC with uh, Al McGuire and Billy Packer when I worked in the conference for Jefferson Pilot. Spent a lot of time with them uh, as our paths crossed. Uh, but I'm talking about working in three major leagues: the NBA, 
the uh, MLB yeah. and uh, the NFL yeah. and, and, and doing it as well or better than anybody else at the time they were doing some other team, Bill King was a guy. Well, correct me if I'm wrong. He was a guy, and we'll get some other questions. He was a guy, if I'm not mistaken, that had one of the most legendary moments of all time. I got it on tape. You got it on tape. <laughs> you always right? speak in the NBA? Yes. Yes, yeah, so I got it on yes. tape. And, 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 well, With I mean, an official? Yes. I got it. Yes. I got it. And that was? It was a little rough. Well, I know. We don't have to use all the words, but. <laughs> it's a little rough. This is thinking on your feet. Huh? This is thinking on your feet. Who, me? No, King, when, oh. when, when, with this whole thing. So tell the story. Well, I don't, I don't, it's been so long since I've heard it, but that's the one that stands out. It was in a regular NBA game, and there was a call that he felt was absolutely the worst call he's ever seen. It went against the Golden State Warriors. Had it not been against the Golden State Warriors, it would have made no difference. <laughs> but he lost his mind, and he screamed at this guy. And all this is on the air. I mean, he, he just lost his composure, and it was eloquent. It was flowery. It was to the point, and how in the world he survived, I don't know. I'm not sure who the official was. I had a problem the same way when I did, although thank God there was no profanity involved. Uh, Eddie Middleton, who was an a ABA official and then later went to the NBA, and mm -hmm. he made a call against Charlie Scott one night in, at uh, the Salt Palace in Utah, that was a shot at the buzzer, and if the shot goes, uh, Virginia wins. And it was clear that Charlie had released the shot before the horn sounded, and, and Middleton waved it off. And so now the game's got to go to overtime, and, and Utah beats Virginia. And um, I, the horn sounded because the game, the regulation was over, so we went to a commercial break, and I screamed at him. And kept screaming and kept screaming. He finally came over before the commercial ended, and he said, I'm going to do the best favor I've ever done for you. And I said, what's that? <laughs> he said, you open your mouth one more time, and you're going to be watching this game from outside on the street. I said, you can't throw me out. He said, try me and see if I can't. I didn't try. Yeah. Yeah. But the Bill King thing, he's screaming at the official, profanity laced. Yeah, it was it ends time. up going out over the air. It did. And once he realizes that it was on the air, and when I'm talking about quick on your feet, something to the extent, if I remember the story right, was he said, I want to apologize for a fan sitting right behind us yeah, in the stands. Something that's correct. Along those lines. That's yeah, what he did. Yeah, yeah. That's what he did. And he, and he beat the rap. That's right. Because he, he was so quick on his feet. That wouldn't happen now. <laughs> no. Um, okay. <laughs> Colin wants to know. Yes, Colin. This is a good question. I'm sure it is. Which manager did you most enjoy doing the pregame show with, and which manager was the toughest to do the pregame show with? That's a good question because you were down there for tens of thousands of interviews yeah. every single day. Well, I, there, there would be two uh, that I enjoyed the most, and, uh, and that would be Sparky and it would be Pete. Um, because, you know, it, it, and, and you've done enough of this to know – if you're doing an interview, if you're doing a regular show with a manager and, and there are times, no matter how great the team is, when things are not going well and there are days when you show up and you may say, hey, I don't know how I don't have a whole lot to talk about. Yeah. All Pete would tell you is he said, you ask me one question and I'll tell how long you need. And, and he was and Sparky. Sparky was the same way. Pinello was good. Uh, the toughest was John McNamara who was one of my favorite people of all time. Mac passed away a number of years ago. He came in after the 78 season in a very controversial move by the club when they fired Sparky, and they brought John in to manage the club. And John had two strikes against him as far as I was concerned because, and for no reason because I didn't even know him. Um, Sparky and I were very close, and McNamara came in, and over the years in which he managed the club, he and I became very, very good friends, very close friends. Um, he was tough because he was a man of few words. He really did not have a whole lot to say to the point where they uh, it, 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 it was a struggle to, at times to get through uh, the show with him, but we always managed to do it. But he, he was the toughest one because he was not – uh, you know, he was not eloquent. He was not outgoing, but he was just a great person. Uh, but but they were the guys. Yeah, anybody that's ever was ever around John McNamara loved that guy. Yeah, sweet man. Uh, Trace Fowler, he's a boss, so we got to ask his question. <laughs> okay, I, I told him it was tired, but maybe you'll like it. It probably uh, is tired. But go most ahead. underrated city he had to travel to or work. 
and why? Underrated city. Gosh. I don't know. Is this, is, is, let me ask you your opinion about this question. Is this something that he's looking for? I mean, he's betting no, up. Okay. No, I just think that he, and we, we could ask him. We could bring him in. He's right around that the most corner. underrated city. Yeah, I mean, so in oh, other I, words, I, I, a lot I, of people no. will say, oh, God, I hate going to Pittsburgh. But I, I mean, bingo. in actuality, okay. Bingo. Is that it? <laughs> Talk that up. Underrated? No, I didn't. I okay, right, okay. well, then, I tell you an underrated, I, the one that people looked at me like I had three heads when they would ask a similar question. What is one? What are your favorite cities to go to? And inevitably, I would say Milwaukee. Yeah. And they would look at me like I had three heads. And I would say, obviously, you've never been there because you would not react that way. I love to go there. We stayed at the Ch the uh, Fister Hotel, yeah. which is uh, Great a, a national landmark. Yeah. Uh, um, it, there was always something going on. Uh, you know, they might have uh, Polish week. They might have uh China week, whatever the case, there was something going on in the city uh, almost every week in the summertime. Summerfest, big music S festival yes, thing every summer. huge. And, and I just uh, I love the people, uh, love the golf courses too. Yep. Um, but Milwaukee would have been a town. Now, and one of the places, now to carry that further, when I did college basketball working in the ACC, uh, I, I worked with a guy named Mike Patrick, who I'm sure people remember from his days with ESPN. Mike was a great basketball play-by-play mm -hmm. -play guy. And he would do half the schedule, and I'd do half the schedule. And one of the cities that I grew to request, and people would thought I was stupid, was Clemson, South Carolina. I love going to Clemson. I mean, they had great – they have a, had fish camps down there where the food was sensational. Uh, they had a legendary SID named Bob Bradley, and he was later replaced by a fellow by the name of Tim Bure. And so I would request going to Clemson to do games. But they would they would be a couple that would come to mind. Yeah, it's still a great place yeah, to go, is. Clemson. Uh, interesting one here from Jim McCauley. wants to know, uh, do you have a biggest regret from your career? Uh, no, I don't think so. If I had to, If I had to go back – and and have the freedom obviously we never you, you can't do this but i mean i if i could change anything i would not change uh i don't think i'd change anything other than to try and do something that you've done amazingly well and that is to spend more time with your kids um i would have tried to figure out a way because it really got to the point where um after i got here and established some type of rec, rec, uh, reputation it, it was hard for me to say no to anybody mm -hmm. that would contact me and say, we want you to do our games. This was primarily in basketball. I, I would probably try to do less um, of that and spend more time uh, with you and Dawn that I did when you all were growing up here in Cincinnati. But in terms of a, 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 a vocation decision, um, I don't think I'd change a thing. I turned down a job when I was working in Salisbury I turned down a job to do Davidson College basketball on WBT radio, which is a 50,000-watt radio station in Charlotte. And that was when Lefty coached uh, Davidson. Yep. And they had great players there. They had Fred Hetzel. Uh, they had Dick Snyder. Both of them were great players. Snyder was an incredible NBA player. Uh, and they were in the top five every year. And I turned that job down. And people thought I was crazy because – uh, they had a sports director there by the name of Jim Thacker who did ACC basketball. Yep. And I knew Jim was going to be there for the rest of his life and that I would never be anything more than number two. And so for that reason, I turned it down. And four or five months later, I got a chance to go to Virginia to do the Squires games. Um, okay, this is a good one here. Jason Cummins wants to know, all-time red starting lineup, Oh, but – you can only use four players from the Big Red Machine team. Ooh, that's a good. That's, that's a, a really great good question. That's a great question. Yes. All right. Well, let me tell you the four players I'd use first to make it easier. Right. I mean, obviously, Bench would be behind the yep. plate. Morgan would be at second base. Yep. Um, Pete would be at third. That's three. And uh, Davey would be at shortstop. Okay. No, I take that no, back. I, was I take. No, I take now. that back. Um, so I'm down now to and I, Perez. Well, he, I'd take Tony Perez. 
and over, I, over uh, Votto. I would take Tony Perez. Okay, so all right. So if it's Perez at first, Morgan at second, Pete at third, bench behind the plate. Yep. Shortstop, I'm assuming Barry Larkin. Barry Larkin would be a shortstop. Okay. Correct. Outfield? Uh, so I got I have a left fielder and a right fielder. And correct? a center fielder. Oh my God. Um I take Eric Davis in center. Okay. Um, are these guys I'd have to I had to see or I had to be a part of, or just guys that that I felt like uh, off the you're Reds. picking your best lineup Reds team Reds, uh, from all the Reds teams you've announced? Oh, you, that I had to be a part of. Yes. So I can't take Frank Robinson. No, no. Man, oh man. I mean, where does um, is Junior in this mix? Junior would be in right field. Okay, Junior in right. I need Eric a, Davis in center. Tracy Jones in left. You know, <laughs> probably not. That would probably not work out. Okay. No. Um, left fielder. What about Greg Vaughn? He was only there for one I year. I know, but I'm now, saying. You know what? The guys that I saw, yeah, i take him for one year because he had 46 home runs that year. And uh, he put the team on his back in September. I think he had 16 home runs in September. He Guys were scared to death of him. Because if, if he jumped you, which he would, if he didn't think you were playing up to the standards that he thought you should be playing at, he would get in your face in front of his teammates. And if you wanted to do something about it, he'd do that too. And they knew that. Um, besides that, he's one of my favorite Reds players of all time. So, yeah, I'd say that would be the lineup. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good lineup. Okay. Um, Who Day wants to know. Who yes. Day 26 wants to know. What was it like the day Joe Nuxall retired? It was tough. Um, you know, he and I had an incredible relationship. Uh, they just got better and better and better with every year that, that passed. And uh, we went into that season knowing that um, it was going to be his last year. But we never – and he and I, were we were never the kind to you know, show our emotions toward each other. We both understood how the other felt about you, yourself. And so we go through the whole season, and we don't even acknowledge it. And now we get to the last game of the season, and um, we do the game, still not a word. Go to the commercial when the last out is made, come back to do the post-game show, and I said on the radio, I said, I guess we have to talk about it. He said, yeah, I guess we do. And um, I started to talk, and I couldn't. I, I, I got too emotional. I couldn't talk about it. And he said to me on the air, he said, I guess you need some help, don't you, little buddy? Because that's what he used to call me. And I said, yeah. And so we got through it. And, uh, but it was very, very difficult. And uh, the, the last time, I'll take it a step further, the last time, and I've got a picture in my house here, and I've got a picture in North Carolina of the same picture. A picture of us at Kenwood Country Club, the last day that we were together ever, and uh, we were uh, we were fulfilling a, 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 an opportunity to play golf with us, won by a couple of guys um, in an auction, and so it was in November, um, and uh, Joe was not in good health. Uh, Joe was not strong enough to play eighteen holes of golf. But he came, <clears throat> and you well know how the layout is. The parking lot is on – you have to drive past the clubhouse to the parking lot, and then you have to come back and then go over that little side road going down to where the carts are and the pro shop is. And so we get there, and um, uh, Joe's got a van. He drove a van, and I said, why don't you let me – uh, go get the cart and come back and get your clubs and put them on. He was going to hit shots, and, you know, he was a great storyteller. He and Ben Scully, the two greatest storytellers I've ever been around. And so I did, and we go out and we play, and um, um, he was he did exactly what he said in the first nine holes, but I could tell he was really getting tired. And so I said at the break, I said, why don't I just, you know, take your clubs back to your van and you go back to Fairfield? He said, no. I told those guys I was going to be here for 18 holes, and I'm going to be. And so we get to the 14th tee box, and we were just sitting there, and he said to me, we really had a good time, didn't we? And I thought, oh, man. And, and, and I'm convinced 
And we never, we never, like I said, we never talked about stuff like that. And I was convinced then, in, in retrospect, I look back on it, and I realized that he intuitively felt that that was the last time that we were ever going to see each other again. We finished that day. We said our goodbyes. Uh, I left on Saturday to go on the baseball cruise, which Amanda and I are going on next week. It'll be the 38th, and I've been on every one of them. And um, I don't I don't know that it was intuition on my part, but I made sure that I had the necessary phone communication because we were going to leave out of Los Angeles and go down what they call the uh, Mexican Riviera that I would have phone contact anywhere I was, whether I was in the middle of the Pacific, whatever the case might be. So we go off, we leave Saturday. This golf thing with Joe had occurred, I think on a Monday or Tuesday. And I go to bed on Saturday night and I wake up in the middle of the night and my message light is on my phone. And I, pick it up to check and it was Rob Butcher the Reds media relations director calling and all he said was 911 and I was in a fog half sleep it did not even uh, impact me I went back to sleep and at seven o'clock my phone rings and it's our good friend John Burns and John is talking you know he mentions Joe and he said and and, and I I don't know what he's talking about. And finally, he said to me, you don't know, do you? And I said, I don't know what. He said, Joe died last night at 11 o'clock. And so I was on the phone all day that day in the middle of the Pacific talking to radio stations, TV stations, newspaper people. And I, I, go, I really go back, and I think that Joe knew that that was going to be the last day. And I have a picture of he and I in both of my homes. Um, it, it was an incredibly special relationship. Um, I, it's hard for me to put into words the way we were as two guys that thought so highly of each other. And, and you know, the first year I did the Reds games, it took four months before Joe finally would stop calling me Al. <laughs> yeah, Al Michaels. <laughs> yeah, and it would be into June, and he something would happen. He'd say, well, Al, and he'd catch himself, and he'd feel so bad because he felt like he hurt my feelings. That's, that's the way he was. And, and it, finally he got out of it. And I said, well, I hope to God he got out of it. We were together for 31 years. Sooner or later, Marty's got to supersede Al. And it finally worked out that way. All right. Uh, Cincy Kid 14. Yes. What's the best aspect about living in Cincinnati? That's hard. I, we don't have enough time. Okay. I mean, every, every opportunity I had to leave here and go somewhere else, and somewhere else included the Red Sox and the Yankees and – um, the San Francisco Giants and the Chicago Cubs and the Chicago White Sox. Um, I never could leave here. Uh, and I think it had more to do with its city than it had to do with the job. Um, nobody's loved Cincinnati more than I do uh, today. Um, the older I get, the more the cold weather just grates on me and wears me out. And I'm not looking forward to what's coming now beginning today. Yeah. But, um, I, I I made the decision to stay. I never regretted. The closest I ever came was going to the Red Sox. And at the end of the day, I said no to that. Um, so uh, there's no aspect of this town that, that, that I don't uh, thoroughly love. Um, and, and thank God of all the places I could have gone to do big league baseball, this was a town. Mm -hmm. Because you know, I think there are only five guys that uh, have done major league baseball 40 plus years and did it with one team and i'm proud of that because uh i cast my lot with the city of cincinnati and the city of cincinnati did not disappoint me at all uh let's see here don don's in ohio wants to know i remember when your son tom broke his leg while vacationing trying to surf or skimboard Yes, indeed. Says Marty was not very happy. Marty was not. He happy. was calling the game, and said, "I'm told that he had serious words for his son, even as a grown man." True or false? That would be true. Okay, that would be accurate. <laughs> yeah, you hit a stump, didn't you? Yeah, I, I didn't want to ask that question, but here you we remember are. the doctor. 
the doctor in what? That that took care of you with the leg. In oh wait, are you talking about? I'm talking about in Cincinnati. Oh yeah, I, no, I'm talking about the one when I broke it a few years ago, skimboarding in San Diego. You're talking about when I was in high school and broke my leg. That's correct. My femur. Yes. And that would be sled riding. Yeah. Yes. 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 I don't remember the doctor. Yeah. Okay. The what? No. I now, now that you bring it up, what happened in San Diego? I was not happy at yeah. all with that. Yeah. I wasn't either. No. Yeah. I, I did wax rather eloquent on it. I wasn't happy either. I know you. I Trust know you me. Yeah. It's stupid, really. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Do you think this comes from Ken? Do you think there will ever be a salary cap, or at least more equitable revenue sharing? To make things more fair in Major League Baseball? I do not. I don't think you'll ever see it happen in our lifetime. Okay. Uh, I, I can't imagine a scenario that would create an opening for that to occur. Um, that's why I maintain uh, all, uh, with all the years that have gone by and all the commissioners that have come and gone in every single sport there is, the greatest of them all, and there's no contest, has been, was Pete Rozelle. Because he had the foresight yep. and the wisdom to realize how important that would be in Major League Sports. No doubt. And then we're talking about back in the 60s now is what we're talking about. He was the greatest. Uh, one, one, uh, one fan wanted to know why not Adam Dunn in left field? Well, Adam Dunn had his problems defensively. Yeah. You know, um, uh, you know what, though? But uh, quite honestly – uh, you look at his offensive numbers, and I, I'm not nearly as critical of Adam Dunn as I was, but I think I've gotten a lot more mellow in terms of some people, and, and, and I was hard on Adam Dunn because of his defense. But, boy, you look at his offensive numbers uh, as a Cincinnati Red and his on-base percentage as a Cincinnati. He would be – can you imagine what kind of money he would command? Oh, man. Today, yeah, I mean he he's the analytics poster ab, without any question. Yeah, home without, run walks, and I you know one guy I'm, I'm, Kyle Schwarber. I'm thrilled to death he's in the World Series because he's a great young man. You know he went to Middletown. Yeah, yeah, he did. Okay, yeah, that's a joke. No, it's a joke because Reds fans used to get on my case. Oh, that's correct. Every time he came, so I started doing it I just for them. So I just did it. For I like now. that. I yeah. like that. Just tweaked them a little bit. Played football. Nothing in Middletown. wrong with that. Was a linebacker. May not know that. See that? You see, you you had a little bit of me in you because I would do that with Christian Leitner. What about him? Well, I mean, he's the most hated person in the history of Kentucky sports. Period. Well, Nobody's no even. Doubt. And I did that game, yeah. the Kentucky Duke game, when he hit the shot that beat Duke. And every season, <laughs> baseball season, I would figure out a way to mention his name, and they would predictably lose their friggin' minds. <laughs> and, that, and I finally, after about 100 years of doing it, I finally say, look, step back and take a big deep breath and realize it ain't going to go away. And, and he hit the shot, and he did, should have been thrown out of the game because he stepped on the chest of uh, the Timberlake kid, where he should have been thrown out right then. He wasn't, and he hit the shot, and he capped off a perfect day. He was perfect from the field. Yep. Perf one of the great college basketball players of all time. He beat you. Get over it. But I'd say you did the same thing with that tweaking thing. Oh, about, you, you got know, you got to do it. You got to do it. Every now and then you got to. And, and now they're doing it to me with Nick Castellanos. I know so they are. Goes around. I, I understand. Uh, you know what I mean. That's just you made, point made. Who, by the way, you know, we pointed out that it, it's funny, and, and I mean, I don't want to take credit for it. You know, I, I'm not going to take credit for it because you you have to be superstitious to do that. Yeah. Um, but it's funny. <clears throat> We, when we were planning the show launching, we thought it would be perfect to have as the very first guest on the show, Nick Castellanos. Right. Right? So in August, Brandon Seho and I contact him, and, and I end up having a, a, a lengthy back and forth with him, both talking on the phone and texting. He's like, i love to do it. Be crazy about doing it. I think everything that happened for both of us is just insanity in this world that we live in today. He said, I'd love to do it. Calls, I said, well, you think about it. And, and he calls me back on the phone. He said, you know what? And this was in August when right. they were just starting to kind of get it going. Yeah. You know, they had fired Girardi, <laughs> and this was mid-August. And he's like, you know, I got a feeling our team is going to make the playoffs. And I don't want to create any distraction for anybody on my team that I play with. So whenever our season's over, I'll be the first guy on the show the next day. 
So now here they are. Can you believe they're in the World Series? You go follow up and try to get him? I, I, definitely. Because he said he'd do it. And he meant it. And, and, I tell and you, know, it. you know what? They love living here. Yeah. His whole family. Yeah, did. they did. So I don't know why he would not do it. Yeah. Yeah. He was, um, you know, look, he was a part of the whole Reds thing. And I, I don't think anybody in their right mind, no one in their right mind, thought the Reds had any chance in the world, even knowing he loved playing. Correct. Correct that they were not going to sign him. Yeah. And I don't think anybody begrudges the Reds for not signing him. No, I don't him. think so. Um, you can get into the whole debate about all the players that they traded away, whether it was Winker. I was never a big Winker guy. Suarez was starting to do one of these. Uh, Sonny Gray, all this kind of stuff. What now, As you look at the Reds franchise now, and I said before you came in today, because there were a lot of questions to ask you about this, 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 and this. I said, look, I'm not doing that because he's been with the Reds for a long, long time. I'm not putting somebody in a position to do that. I didn't do it when Dave Lapham was with us a couple weeks ago or Dan Hordy's with us every week. Right. They're employed by the team. But when you look at the Reds right now and the franchise moving forward, um, what are your thoughts on the state of the franchise? Attendance is way down, way, way down. But that happens when you have a bad team. It'll come back around if they had a good team. Sure. But what are your thoughts about the state of the franchise? Well, I think that, uh, you know, they made a decision. And, and I'm sure that they, meaning uh, ownership and, and Nick Kroll and everybody else involved, that they were going to rebuild. Now, you know, to, to, to form some understanding of the uh, upset fans it's the second time that they have, quote, rebuilt in the last six or seven years, whatever the case might be. But they made the decision to unload big contracts and in return get high talent from other clubs in the process. Um, and they did that. And they, they jumped, their farm system jumped from, I think it was 15th among all farm systems to fourth in all of Major League Baseball because of the influx of young talent. Um, the fact of the matter is, that I don't care how good you are or how good you are anticipated to be coming out of high school and coming out of college, it's still a roll of the dice. You never know. If these kids pan out, um, they're going to be fine. They're going to be good at a lot of different positions. They have, and I agree with the philosophy that Nick Kroll has, is we will draft and or trade for um, as many good young shortstops mm -hmm. as we can because that's the most athletic position on the field. Uh, you can put him anywhere, and, and they've done that. And so I don't think you can expect it to happen next season, but it, it better begin to show signs big time by 2024. If it doesn't, then every head in that organization should roll because – uh, they have decided that our future is going to be with young talent. And they've gone out and they've gotten a whole bunch of good young talent. Now, I think you'll see some of these kids, mm -hmm. pitchers, that will be given a big chance of making this club uh, in good year come spring training. But the position players, the, the number one guys, this kid, uh, De La Cruz, the shortstop, uh, who was at Dayton, and they moved him to Chattanooga. Uh, he never missed a beat, and he has torn up the fall instructional league out in Arizona. Uh, he's is just a gifted player. I would hope that they would not move him off that position uh, because you never know what's going to happen. Uh, this kid is going to be a great player if he continues to progress as he has, and I think he's an example of what we can look forward to in a couple of years. Uh, before we – and we're almost out of time, but, uh, uh, you know, Casey is, is just starting to really learn baseball. He's not a baseball guy, but he's been around Cincinnati forever. Price Hill guy. Yeah. Um, Paul is a uh, Washington, a uh, 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 Virginian, I guess, right? Yeah, Northern Virginia. Northern Virginia. Where? Uh, uh, right outside D.C., Springfield. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. then we know yeah. the dunce, Brandon Seho, who's on his way uh, over, LaSalle guy. Uh, Certainly and, is. And, and boy, uh, I would not want to be a LaSalle Lancer this, this Friday night. Holy <laughs> Moses. They are playing Winton Woods at offending state. Yeah, that will not be a good that outcome. That is now. not a good matchup. Yeah. Um, fellas, <clears throat> anything you want to ask my dad before he gets out of here? Brandon, anything over there? Oh, we're going to go to me first. Yeah, you guys you, don't have anything. The dunce. first. We start with the dunce. You first. Right. Well, first off, uh, Tom wouldn't let me. I was going to bring in a pack of Laura's Lean and have you sign it for me. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'd have done that. We'll yeah. do that next time. Sure. Yeah, okay. um, you've had a lot of big calls 
what's maybe not your your favorite one, but the most memorable one where it was like you're in the booth and you go, holy cow, you know, that was an incredible moment that I just got to describe and call. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I've never asked that question before. I all I can tell. Well, that's is what, what I'm a hard hitting journalist. That's what I'm here for. Yeah, I know it. That was a good one too. We're not sure really why he's here, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know. I can't. You know, I'd like to say uh, the Carlton Fisk home run, but I was sitting in the clubhouse at Fenway Park in Boston when that happened, waiting for the <laughs> celebration that didn't occur until the next night. Um, I, other than the calls, that the the well, you like the Jay Bruce call. Well, that's a that's a big one. Yeah. I mean, that's that's my maybe my single favorite call. Yeah. And he homered in the t ninth inning off right. of Houston. Yep. Tim, Tim Burdick. Bur yeah. Center what about field. Junior? That's my. I think that's my favorite call from you is knocking the door down to the five hundred. The five hundredth home run was a big. It was a, one of my favorites because um, I was never one to plan what I was going to say. I mm -hmm. don't think you can do it justice if you do that. And I didn't right. do that. Um, it was uh, Father's Day, which really made it nice because mm -hmm. Senior was there and all of his, his wife and kids and um but that was that was that was one of my favorite calls and and the 600th home run uh was okay but it was before about 13 people in miami <laughs> so it really didn't create the kind of stir that doing it in front of a standing room only crowd at father's day and in, in st louis yeah. was for 500 yeah that was it paul yeah i'm just interested you guys talked a little bit about this in the beginning but how much different do you feel like the broadcasting industry is as a whole now than when you started marty when you look at all these different opportunities that guys my age have or, or guys that are, are starting in this versus where you were where you know i don't want to say your generation of it started broadcasting but you don't have the same opportunities when you were no, starting that you do now <laughs> I think there are a lot of similarities, Paul. I think that um, the toughest thing to do is to get a job. Yeah. If you come out of college, I don't care what kind of experience you've had unless you're just gifted and, and you stand out among everybody else. In that graduating class among all the schools in the country, it's tough to get a job. If you get a job, you gotta, you got to go wherever you I, I tell young people, they, they come up to me and I, they say, can you give me some advice? I say, well, yeah, let me ask you a question. They say, what's that? I said, are you in love? And they're kind of taken aback. And a guy would say, well, what's that got to do with it? I said, it's got everything to do with it. Because if you got a chance to go to Missoula, Montana and get a broadcasting <laughs> job and they're not paying you hardly enough to live on, you can't be burdened by having a girl that you're in love with. You can be in love two or three years from now and get married when you're more established financially. And I think that's true today. Um, yeah. You know, if your wife works, that's fine. Um, I don't think it's really changed a whole lot in terms of entering the profession, other than the fact that it's the most competitive field that I think you can get into it because there is certain glamour attached to it. I mean, nobody had a better job on earth than I did. I mean, doing all the stuff I did, traveling the country at somebody else's expense, associating with the people that I associated with. Um, I don't think there's a better job to have, um, but it's really tough to, to make inroads and, and get the kind of job that you want yeah. to start with. All right. I have one, one other question because a few people have, uh, have sort of asked the same type of thing. So I want to make sure we get right. this answer out of you. Your favorite golf course to play? Your big golfer, Marty. My favorite golf course I've ever played was uh, Kings Barnes outside of St. Andrews in, in cool. Scotland. But I've just come off of two weeks, two months ago, playing golf in Ireland. And, uh, I mean, I played uh, Old Head in, in, in Ireland. Is, the beauty is overwhelming. There's a lighthouse on the end of a point. Uh, Bally Bunyan, Waterville, Adair Manor, which is where they're going to play the Ryder Cup in 2027. And then the Royal Dublin Golf Club and Port Marnock. All they got for me, there are better golf courses in Ireland than there are in Scotland from top to bottom. Really? Uh, the most famous golf course of all, of course, is St. Andrews, uh, you know, the old course in St. Andrews. Uh, but the courses in Ireland and the country is I'm a big Irish fan because the people are great. The, the beauty is, is, is unparalleled and the golfing is wonderful. But I would say that Kings Barnes that was built by a couple of guys from Houston, Texas, outside of St. Andrews is probably the finest golf course I've ever played. All right. Casey, 
I got one question. Yes. Well, you came up with something. This is huge here. Stop the bus. He he gave you all the time in the damn world to come up. Stop the bus, as they say. Stop that. that, I want to get off. That's (laughs) right. (laughs) Not my brother. Go ahead. Nothing to do with baseball or your career. Okay. It's got to do with your fondest memory of Tom. What is just something that you find that was so funny or something very endearing that he did well, when he was a kid? That, let me tell you something. When he was just a young boy, and we had, I don't think we'd been in Cincinnati very long, I don't know, maybe a year or so, and he would come down, he, his, his mother would bring him down to the ballpark, and normally he'd come with a friend. He wouldn't go as early as I would go. And then they would be, you know, they would be their own, uh, you know, they'd supervise their own stay and they would rarely ever do anything wrong. And he never did at the ballpark. I, he could, he'd be in his seats or he could come up to the radio booth and, and, and he, he, his, his deportment was wonderful. I finish a game one night and I go home and I walk in the front door and his mom, my wife, Brenda said, where's Tom? <laughs> You remember this? Oh, yeah. And I said, what do you mean, where is Tom? She said, he and whoever was you know, with you, I don't know who you brought that night, they were supposed to ride home with you. Uh-oh. Well, I was, now it's hotter than a match. <laughs> <laughs> I had to get back in the car and drive back downtown to Riverfront to get him and his buddy. Mm-hmm. And I was not happy. <laughs> you remember that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Tom was Tom Tom was a good guy. Tom I I was blessed because I had th- three kids and Tom and Dawn and and my youngest Ashley which I had very very little if any problem with. And and I think that I think a lot of it had to do with the people they hung with. Cuz I think you run with a bad crowd you're going to get in trouble and they did not do that. I'm sure there are a lot of things. In fact, we this is not the proper venue to talk about things that occurred as Tom got older Uh, and Tom went to college and Tom worked at the beach and uh, what we did touch those bases at a recent gathering of guys that you went to high school with and it made him a little bit nervous Um, (laughs) but that would be better left for another day but uh, I'm I'm proud of my son Um, he's such a better person than I will ever hope to be and I mean that sincerely because of all he's gone through and the way he's dealt with it. And uh, I'm proud to tell people my only son is named Tom Brenneman, and, and, and I'll always feel that way. Uh, and I've got one last thing for you guys. This is just the cherry on top. Cherry on top presented by UDF. Presented by UDF. Big. All right, here we go. Not only did we break viewer count, we almost made it to 100 concurrent viewers, okay, which right. is awesome. Yeah. You're great, Marty. Tom, you're also great. You guys together, amazing. Off the charts today. Thank, Thank you, guys. Wait, where's Thank uh? You. That's Thank for you. having him in here today. Yeah. We had he a good time today. Our show to a whole Brad, new level. good to see you, man. Wait a minute. We should have got Tracy Jones in here with you. You two going I back and forth, with Tom. Oh, we got to do that sometime. Oh, oh man, we, we, we man. Do that, that, sometime. that would be. We got to do that sometime. Yeah, we'll do that sometime. And uh, you know, look, uh, Tracy. Uh, and and Dad, uh, you guys, uh, you know, you do your thing. Brennan and Jones on baseball. We got Tracy a couple days a week here. He yep. does his thing here. It's a fun bit. Been a good day today. I've enjoyed this. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. you. Thank you, guys. Guys, thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. Adios. See you tomorrow. Off the bench, presented by United Dairy Farmers. Thanks to Marty Brennan. Great day.